Welcome to Making Conversations, a podcast from makers Gemma Millen and Robin Galway. Today we are making conversations with Maria McCormack, textile artist from Randallstown, County Antrim, Northern Ireland. Hi and welcome to the first episode of our Makers series featuring Maria McCormack. We hope you enjoyed our previous Taster episode, which was at Ulster University 2019 degree show. We recorded this episode in my kitchen, um, and it was all the way back in May this year, but my kitchen was not an ideal recording space, so the sound quality is a little echoey, but we have hopefully resolved this for the next few episodes to come. So without further delay, let's listen to how Maria got started. I did a foundation degree whenever I came out of uh, school, so I went to a grammar school and I was very focused on um, kind of science and business mm-hmm. and art was very, very disregarded. Okay. As much as my art teacher fought for it, it was definitely not respected by other teachers and it wasn't seen as a viable career at all. Mm-hmm. So I was um, one of the only people in my art class to actually go on to do art. And everyone else kind of went down those other more sort of employable, quote unquote, um, mm. degrees, um, which is fine if they want to do that. But I think it's definitely something that needs supported more at all levels. Yeah. So I went on to do my foundation degree in the University of Ulster. And that was a real struggle coming from a grammar school where they literally held your hand and told you what you needed to do to get marks because mm-hmm. everything was so focused on marks because everyone needed four A stars for whatever professional they were going to yeah. become um, and arts was very uh, lax in that way and it was more about your portfolio which it should be yeah. um, but then you get to foundation degree and it's all about kind of it's that level of maturity which I think some people need and some people don't and I'm really glad that I had that year because mm-hmm. I was very handheld and brought through everything with my grammar and school education and then I get to foundation and they're like, build a chair out of masking tape and mm. draw 32 pairs of underwear and do all these things. <laughs> and then I could never really understand the logic and reason behind it, which was really frustrating at the start because that's kind of how I'd been brought up or brought through education. Mm. Um, and everything had to have a purpose or I couldn't really understand just doing something to kind of open your mind or free yourself or loosen yourself up. Mm-hmm. Um, so then by the end of it, yeah, kind of, had that level of maturity but didn't have a lot of technical skills which I know other foundation courses have um I mean I don't know what it's like now but certainly that was my experience of it and then um I went on to do a textile degree so it's textile art with design and fashion Mm -hmm. and that that's structured in a way that allows you to get those basic skills the first year you do sort of four week workshops of embroidery print knit weave and fashion and mm-hmm. um, so you get all those kind of technical skills of yeah. how to work the machinery and um, how to pattern cut how to uh, design and do all these things and then you choose what you want to specialize in mm-hmm. um, and then just develop your skills from there so uh, it was really helpful in that sense and then as the years progressed you develop more uh, your ideas more in uh, concept development and kind of bring in and other contexts into as well as having the basic foundation of technical skills you kind of add your intellectual skills to it as well yeah oh, okay so um you said that you went from your grammar school to the foundation that you, you did a levels um yes before that then mm-hmm. um what, what why did you choose the university of ulster as such for your foundation um what was it a conscious did, did you intend to then follow up and go on to the bachelor's course? Um, yeah, so I, I did a foundation degree initially because I didn't know what I wanted to specialise in. Okay. And then I knew that the kind of idea of a foundation degree was to try a bit of everything. And then I think I just kind of fell into those rumours of people that went to this place didn't get in or um, mm. I really wanted to go to Limavady actually, um, but it was just too far away and it wasn't overly practical and then if I lived out there there wasn't much of a student life mm-hmm. there and um, I think they had student accommodation but there was it wasn't a town that was really built for students mm-hmm. whereas I kind of like, I, like all of my friends were moving to Belfast and it just seemed 
like I immigrated there yeah. out of Valmina, so <laughs> <laughs> like everyone did, I kind of followed that crowd a little bit and um, I think I had this sense as well because I'd been to the open days of um, University of Ulster and I had this sense that it was like a big achievement to get into that course, yeah. even though to do an art degree in itself was really disregarded in my school. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, in textiles then, um, was that just from your foundation that you really enjoyed that subject? Yeah, my my school teacher came from a costume background as well, so whenever I started to show an interest in textiles at school, she was really enthusiastic about it because a lot of people were doing painting and focusing on other disciplines. Um, so she actually taught me how to use the sewing machine and I my portfolio by the end of school was quite textile based and then I did the foundation degree to try other mediums but textile was the one that I was familiar with and it kind of made sense to me and then everything that I did would ultimately translate into textiles sort of subconsciously mm -hmm. um, yeah and that's kind of how that happened and I also like the idea that so the ones that were doing fine art at the end of foundation had to have a very kind of formal portfolio and everything was very structured and clean cut, which isn't me at all. I'm a bit messy and get all over the place. So we just had to kind of present our work on the table and was like, this is what we've worked on for the past eight weeks or whatever. Um, and that was how they assessed you to get into your specialist degree course. And I think at that point it was kind of pass or fail. So, um, you weren't so focused on like getting top marks because you just needed to pass to get in. Yeah. Which was really refreshing coming from the grammar school background. Yeah, oh no, I'm sure it was. Um, because there's a level of maturity, isn't there, between whenever you're in the grammar school ethos, you know, you're in control of how um, you're going to structure your um, education suddenly. It's, it's quite a big leap. Um, yeah, and it's put on you from such an early age, like you have to choose GC GCSEs in third year. Mm. And then, because I have friends that didn't choose the right GCSEs for the career, they eventually figured out that they wanted and then they had to go back and get yeah. different qualifications so for young. different things. Um, so yeah, that's that system could definitely be better. Mm. Okay, so what about, um, you were explaining about how you got these basic skills built up in your first year and in those first few weeks. What was the one that kind of made you think, yeah, right, this is, you know, I, I know there's so many techniques that have to be covered in that short time, but was there something that you thought, I have made the right decision here, this is, I am going to throw myself in. Did you have that moment? Um, um I think everyone has their own experience of their education and if you went to university obviously um, and I remember um, talking to one of my tutors and she explained it and um, she used an analogy of it's just like growing up going through your degree so you come in in first year and you're a little baby and you're still learning all these things and then in second year you try new things and you experiment but sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't so you're kind of a bit like the grumpy teenager <laughs> and then hopefully by the time you get into final year you've matured and everything kind of comes together and it's just a nice feeling um, and that was my experience of it and um, I remember first year was because I'd done the foundation year so it wasn't completely new you were learning new skills but they were quite technical and once you knew them you knew them and you could just develop them more. It wasn't something you had to go back constantly and keep redoing to learn it. Um, and then there were some workshops I did that I just took to more naturally than others. Like I really loved print, um, but I'm not a technical person and print is very technical. Mm -hmm. I remember really, I specialized in it for first and second year and I really wanted to make it work, but I just don't think like that. And I, there were people there that just picked it up instantly or were able to just have a really solid grasp on how to do certain things in a certain way whereas I would kind of tend to work backwards and be like so I want to try something like this but I don't know how to do it and then I try and figure it out but they would have the technical understanding and then be able to do something with that um, and then knit I kind of enjoyed but um, couldn't easily translate concepts or designs into something that was knitted and mm. people can do that and they've made wonderful things and that's great but I, it was technical as well mm. um, and the same with weave um, because it had to be a kind of 
uh, it started off as a 2D kind of uh, warp and weft thing. I just didn't really think like that. So embroidery was one that I really took to because it was more flexible for me mm -hmm. um, because you could do lots of different things with hand embroidery and different um, types of machines. You get different textures, you could use different materials and it just seemed like it was um, more, more flexible but you had more choice in how you approached it as well whereas other things you kind of you use this machine in this way and you do this for this and you use that for that but this was kind of oh you can use this and implement to this machine and add this to it so that's kind of what I was drawn to mm -hmm. um, and I also um, they start talking about whether you're an artist designer or maker quite early on um, and that helped me to understand how I work and I think the tutors can see it basically from the start whether you're which disciplines you want or leaning towards or if you're an artist designer or maker or you cross into both of them but it is a real kind of personal journey for each individual in which kind of direction they go to so I remember I got to my degree show and kind of realized like oh I'm a maker and then my tutor was like yeah like you've been a maker all along <laughs> and I was like oh there was a penny kind of dropped so. yeah and can you um explain what your degree show what pieces you had there for the audience <laughs> and so they kind of get a visual grasp of what it was because I know that you've made work since that has been similar but also very different as well. Yeah so I um, I specialised in textiles um, and textile art with embroidery mm -hmm. and then um, I was really inspired by a box um, of old receipts that my that my granddad had um, I was in a biscuit tin, as everything tends to be mm -hmm. here. Um, it's a real <laughs> joy if you find biscuits in a biscuit tin. <laughs> um, so, yeah, these are old receipts from the sort of 40s, and uh, there's a letter from uh, the 1920s that my uh, granddad had written to my grandmother. Um, and they just received them. Some of them were really kind of mundane. Um, he, my granddad was a farmer, so it was receipts for animal meal or hardware whatever um but I really liked how they looked so they're on different colored paper and some of them had rust stains on them uh, with the paper clips that were on them and just the way that they'd folded and aged over time um, and I was just really drawn to the aesthetic of them so it wasn't necessarily the content and what they were about um, and I, was, I started collaging around that time so um, I would use these papers and kind of put them together um, in a, I suppose it's kind of fine art way um, but I was doing a textile degree so I couldn't just work with paper um, and I had to figure out how to translate what I was inspired by um, into a concept that I wanted to represent and then translate that into textiles as well so I tried all different types of printing and uh, screen printing was just too clean cut because um, everything was very precise lines and neat and uh, you couldn't really get the texture of the papers across and mm -hmm. um, like the folds in them or the dog ears you just couldn't translate that into something that was flatly printed and mm -hmm. um, so I started experimenting with uh, printing directly onto linen um, through an inkjet printer and it was just something that I tried one time and uh, of course, the fabric got stuck in the printer. I had to yank it out and then take my whole printer apart and put it back together again. <laughs> um, but I actually really liked it. It ended up being a happy accident because I tore out or I unpicked all the uh, bits that I didn't like and then ended up darning back into them or stitching over them. Um, and I, I, from then, that was the real kind of turning point where it all made sense and I could combine the collage with the textiles with the print in a way that worked for me and what I wanted it to do um, but then I found different um, kind of associations with what especially with textiles because it's still very much seen as women's work and it's associated with older people knitting or mm -hmm. or something um, and I was very so I, the technical skills that I learned to put the uh, fabric pieces that I printed together was essentially patchwork quilting mm -hmm. but I was so determined that I didn't want the pieces to look like patchwork quilts um, and not because I don't like quilts or anything they're great and there's such a technical skill in it um, but it's just it means that your work's perceived in a certain way and I definitely wanted it to be wall art rather than oh it's a quilt or it's for a functional purpose 
Um, so I uh, tried to present them in a way that they didn't look like a quilt and they weren't square or rectangular and they had kind of odd shapes. Um, but I remember someone coming to my degree show and said like, oh, so they're a bit like um, textile Tetris. Um, I was like, oh, really? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's just interesting how people perceive your work and you can't really control that mm -hmm. um, because people bring up their own perceptions and their own experiences to what they see. Um, so my degree show was a series of um, textile collages, I suppose I call them, based on these receipts and letters that I'd um, photoshopped and taken out of context. And I found that interesting because that's the first thing people try to do is my work, they try to read it and understand it because there is text on it. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever you kind of take text from one letter or one envelope and combine it with text from something else from a different year or a different era, um, you're kind of manipulating that in a way that doesn't make sense and that kind of um, throws people off a little bit because they, it's their way of understanding it. Like, oh, I'll just read this and this will tell me exactly what it is and what it's about. Um, but I kind of like that idea of not making it too obvious or not sort of explicitly explaining or over explaining everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, you mentioned as well about uh, you chose linen um, and, you know, Northern Ireland has such a rich history and heritage of linen, and even the cotton. And, um, you know, was that something that from the start you why could you explain? Sorry, why, why, why did I choose, choose linen? Yeah, linen. sorry, I kind of skipped a bit. So, <laughs> no. um, yeah, so I had to figure out how to uh, move my work from paper to textiles. Um, and some of the, whenever I looked a little further into what was in this biscuit tin that I found, um, my, so I'm from Randallstown and there is, there used to be a linen factory there called the Old Leach. And I found some um, pay slips that my granddad had when he worked there. And I actually ended up um, meeting the old manager of the old bleach factory and he it turns out to be a bit of a hoarder um, but he's so lovely and he invited me around to his house and he managed to um, kind of salvage all of these documents from the factory whenever it was closing down in the 80s um, but these were like letters from the 1800s um, with calligraphy and wax stamps and um, like the king, I've never seen the king on a stamp before. Mm -hmm. um, so I just found it all really interesting. And then that they all happened to be about the old beach and I, I'm not a science population of about 5,000. So it's a really tiny town. It was probably smaller back then. Um, but almost everyone in the town and surrounding area was employed by this factory. And everyone had some story to do with the factory, whether they'd worked there or their parents worked there. And, um, yeah, I just find that was really interesting for a town that I was from and I kind of took it for granted. And then I realised they had offices in New York and London and Paris and they'd done all these trade shows and they were really ahead of the game in terms of the design in industry. Um, and then they made uh, the linens for the Buckingham Palace and the royal family and they made little dolls clothes out of linen for the royal family as well. So it was just these little treasures that... Um, I came across in a kind of unexpected place mm -hmm. um, and then it, so it made sense to transfer some of the um, these papers about the factory onto linen mm -hmm. um, and then I was really lucky in the university as well so they have a good a good supply of linen um, and they get lots of um, off cuts and things from like Ulster weavers and different factories um, so I really like the idea of using fine fabrics as well so you weren't buying off a roll and it was completely new. I think it was a little bit like the blank canvas of, um, or the white blank page. Mm -hmm. um, but if it had a mark on it or a stain or a hole in it, then you could mend it or repair it in some way or respond to what was already on it. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where the whole linen connection came. Okay. Okay, so being from Randall's time then, um, have you got a connection with the textile heritage that's there at all, or is that? Is that um, so my my dad, aunt, uh, granddad, and great aunt and great uncle all worked in the factory at some stage. So they had right. um, my great aunt was a hand painter, um, 
and my granny was an embroiderer and um, my dad was kind of a technical I think he fixed sewing machines and things mm-hmm. um and I'm not really sure what my granddad did but everyone worked there at some point and had some kind of connection to it yeah um and I did a project um as part of the Linen Biennale after I graduated yeah, um nice. that was to do with uh, kind of interviewing members of the local community and about their time in the factory and how they found out and what they thought about linen and I found that a lot of people didn't see what they did as creative um because it was just a job and sometimes in some ways it really wasn't because it was factory work mm-hmm. um so if you were a hand painter you had a certain color that you painted on linen all day mm-hmm. and it was just a production line um but they had a huge design team and they were kind of ahead of the, the game in terms of design and household uh linens and how they can be used and interpreted and what you can put on those so mm-hmm. i mean it was still quite reserved and um conservative in a way but um for the time it was revolutionary to put certain designs on certain tea towels yeah. um and it was really high quality and really sought after so it had a kind of global reputation um so they supplied to countries all over the world and they did the big trade shows and it was really well respected and um, so it was quite so you were therefore respected if you were associated with that or you worked mm-hmm. for the factory in some way mm-hmm. um and then people talk about how well the factory owners treated the workers for the time and how they paid them fairly. But then I also find interesting stories of how they treated each other and played pranks on each other. And there was a kind of community atmosphere there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So would you say your family are, obviously they were in that industry and you're saying that it wasn't necessarily as creative as we would understand creativity today, but would you say... That you come from quite a creative family or you know would your parents be quite creative in how they do sort of everyday tasks or um like i think in some ways um my my dad's very crafty and he's always building things and he loves to use his hands and um he actually made has made a couple of um like wooden replicas of um like the cross keys and little like thatched houses oh, and things and oh, um, my mom wouldn't consider herself creative at, at all um but she is an amazing baker and she really loves to do that um and she also came through that education system where she was left-handed and everything they taught was right-handed so she hates mm-hmm. sewing and textiles and anything to do with that she just associates that with that kind of negative mm-hmm. time um so but yeah, they they're not really overly into textiles, um, but my uh my other granny used to knit a lot and would always kind of be around these textiles, so maybe that fed in a little bit. So was it a surprise for them whenever you uh turned to textiles, or was it kind of inevitable? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think they, uh, just from their upbringing, it's normal or uh, more conventional to um, have a job, a steady job um, or to have even the notion of having one job throughout your career is really changing now and um, I remember towards the end of my degree they were talking about a portfolio career and how you kind of have to be able to turn your hand to all sorts of things um, and that can be a blessing and a curse as well because it's great to have the ability to do that and the experience of that but then it means that you're not necessarily an expert in anything yeah. you're kind of a jack of all trades and master of none um because you do do you do have quite um a lot of different things you sort of multitask at any given time you're always busy yeah, with something you have multiple jobs yeah I have a lot of jobs and i wouldn't <laughs> necessarily recommend that um <laughs> but i think it was that struggle of not necessarily having to prove yourself but there is definitely that association of, oh, you did an art degree and mm-hmm. are you going to live on the dole or, you know, what, how are you going to make a living from that um, without having a steady job? And then you, I feel like no matter what discipline you're in, um, you almost have to fight to uh, be, not necessarily to be paid, but to be respected for the work that you do on the same level that other things are. Uh, it's just taken for granted that, of course, you would pay for certain things or a certain product or service, but whenever it comes to art, I think artists are so almost willing to work for free. Yeah. And there's a fine line between 
get an experience because you need it and then working for experience that you might already have or might not need because they're not willing to pay you because they don't respect the work that you do on the same level that respect other levels mm -hmm. of work and mm -hmm. um, so yeah I think my parents would have liked me to have one job and then they're still kind of learning that you can work in the arts and still make a living but it's probably harder <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh gosh um do you think that they would you say your family or your friends that maybe didn't go through the the um journey that you went through and going to university do, do you think they understand your career do, do you think they understand what you do as a maker um you know definitely not I mean it's so sweet my mom really tries to you know almost memorize word for word what it is that I do so she oh, can tell oh. people about it um but even then it doesn't really make sense for people to really relate to it um mm -hmm. I mean, you tell people that you're a textile artist and then they're like, oh, so do you like make quilts or do you, you know, and they just associate it with what their understanding of textile art is. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, or even to tell someone that you're an artist, like, oh, do you paint things? Mm -hmm. and it's like they say that a lot or, oh, you did an art degree or you're an art teacher. Yeah. And those kind of things that you have to open people's minds up, up about a little bit more and kind of like, oh, well, I do a bit of this and I do a bit of that. And it doesn't just mean this one thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so after you did your MS in the Big Show, mm -hmm. and you went on to, you applied to do the artist residency within the University of Gloucester, how did you find that? Did you find it really enhanced your skills, or did you find it just really, what sort of benefits did you get from that? Yeah, that was a really great opportunity actually, um, because in a way I wasn't kicked out of my bubble quite yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I had the space in the university, uh, I had a studio space and I still have access to all of the resources and the machinery and equipment in the university. Um, but I also realized really quickly that I wouldn't always have that. Mm -hmm. So I, could, I didn't want to make work that meant that I depended on that equipment um, because I couldn't afford to rent it out and I couldn't afford to buy it myself. Um, so I really started to refine my work to work that I could make at home or in the space that I had outside of university. Um, which is when I began to focus more on uh, linen I could print myself mm -hmm. and hand embroidery rather than machines that I didn't have mm -hmm. or wouldn't always have access to. Um, but yeah, it was a really good year. It, you don't get paid for being an artist in residence, uh, but you get access to their uh, space and equipment, which saves you money in a sense. Um, and then I also was able to do a teaching qualification when I was there through the university. Um, and it was it was great to work with students on that course at, in first, second and third year. Um, so I got kind of teaching experience and it was great to teach people that wanted to be taught or that in a discipline that you really enjoy yeah. rather than teaching at secondary school level or primary school level even. Um, and then you, you really empathise with third, like final years because you understand the stress of your degree show and that time of year. Um, and, but it's quite funny because people, I don't know, I find that students are, sort of thought, oh, you're graduated now, so you must know everything. And, <laughs> you know, having this degree means that you have reached this level in life where you know it all and you kind yeah. of, you really don't. Um, and it's great that the degree was so focused on art because you don't get that time back. You don't get that a year to just make art and not do anything else and not have the pressure of having to earn a living. Um, as much as when you do after you graduate um, but then also you there are a lot of things you just have to figure out like how to make a living from this, this degree that you spent three four or five years mm -hmm. um, kind of building your craft and what you can do with the skills that you've had with it um, and there's no like blanket approach there's no one path that sits everyone so in a way you just have to figure it out yourself which is quite harsh but yeah it's sort of how it works um, so, just to go back, sorry, just a little bit to sorry, the degree it. show. Yes. Um, obviously, very stressful time. Um, would you say it was stressful for you? Um, um, I mean, in some ways, but we were lucky, and I know not all courses do it, but we have got our dissertation over with us like before Christmas. Mm -hmm. So, from sort of January to June, you're just making your experience experimenting and like working towards your degree show and um, 
but I know other courses kind of had to do a dissertation alongside that, which was quite stressful. And then everyone has a different journey with their degree. So I'd kind of went through my grumpy teenager stage and then matured <laughs> um, and it just happened to click for me in the final year and I brought all the things that I kind of tried and failed and got really frustrated with and I learned things from that and I was able to bring that forward into my final year um, and everything just started to click into place and um, that's I don't know if that was like a, a really methodical process or if it was luck or a combination of the two but I know other people really struggled because they were they hadn't struggled as much in the first couple of years and then whenever it got to final year there was more pressure because it's like a hundred percent of your degree and yeah. um, so they really struggled to make things work and bring everything together and then there was more pressure because that's when it kind of mattered ultimately and mm. um, so it was it was hard to see like your peers struggle through um, when things didn't work out for them or and it can be expensive as well like if you're spending money on materials and you're printing something and you're doing a whole run of it and then it doesn't work or it shrinks or you wash it and something happens and it's not what you had in mind um, and it's not always something that you can alter or stitch over or sometimes you just have to scrap it and start again mm -hmm. um, and whenever there's a time pressure on that and um, it just makes the whole situation so much more stressful so I really empathize with people in my year that things like that happen to mm -hmm. but there was a really kind of supportive atmosphere because everyone was in the same boat um, everyone understands the stress and pressure that we're under um, so there was a kind of if we could help each other out we did which was a really nice environment to be in definitely yeah did you consciously make a decision to make your work to sell for your degree um, did you do you still have them did you sell it's a bit of a cheeky question but did, did I sell it? did you um, sell anything no I didn't actually I mean I made stuff um, for the kind of degree show shop that we ran and um, collages and sort of prep work that I'd done um, and I sold some of that which was great um, but I think I had it in my head that it was very kind of wall art based and not everyone on not that they don't understand but I think people's perception of wall art might be more fine art based and um, so to put a textile piece on their wall they might not know how to frame it or what to do with it or where to put it or how to care for it um, Oh, just a quick question because I have actually purchased you your, have. Um, very much. <laughs> your uh, artist in residency pieces. How do you care for it? I mean, I got it framed up by the amazing um, Danielle in the framing table, but is there an aftercare? Like, is there a maintenance that you kind of have to keep um, up with? So, the way that I printed them means that they can't get wet. Okay. So, if they are in, their, in a frame, that should be fine. And then, li linen is quite a uh, uh, long-term material as well and um, I mean I feel like that's something that I'm still figuring out and I feel okay. like um, pieces that I have made during my degree I kind of do want to keep an eye on them and years to come and see how they're affected after mm -hmm. so many years um, but yeah there's no I suppose it's not really like um, other materials obviously they can disintegrate but they yeah. like the less they're exposed to, the longer they'll keep. Okay. Well, hopefully not power hose them. <laughs> Very <laughs> safe. <laughs> you know, well respected space. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what do you think of, um, how did you find making your next exhibition and sort of range of work? Because you just seem to be all over the show. I know you just very recently had an exhibition in New York and that's still ongoing. Um, but we'll unfortunately finish before the podcast goes out. Yeah. But, um, how did you find sort of pushing on from that? Because I know myself as a maker, I graduated five years ago, and I find that really difficult to kind of not be a you know, um, one hit wonder where you kind of push on through and continue making. Did you just work through that, or did you know okay the next body of work I want to make is this, and then you kind of went um, on? And, no, uh, I wish I had been that organized. <laughs> I um. The, the residency really helped me with that as well because I was having this kind of, not crisis, but just like, what do I do now? And everything was so laid out for me until then. Mm -hmm. You know, you went to school, you did your A-levels or whatever. Then you went to university and then you graduated and it's like, and then what? Like, then you get a job, but what, what job? And yeah. mm -hmm. um, how do you know, like, did you just get this one job that you work with then forever? Or, and a lot of work in the arts, unfortunately, is short term. Um, 
and I remember speaking to one of the other artists and uh, she had more experience and she was just kind of saying well you just need to keep going like if you want to be an artist you need to keep making art and you can't stop because it's not making you any money or if you're really passionate about it you, you need to keep doing it and work through it and then she was kind of explaining to me everyone has their own journey and you have to do all these things to figure out what it is that you want to do or don't want to do um, and which I hadn't done at that time so I didn't fully understand it but I think whenever you go through that process of trying different things and learning which aspects you really like about certain jobs or which skills you can translate from one thing to another um, I mean some people are quite decisive about um, you know some I know people that have graduated with that want a job that's completely unrelated to their arts so that they can just go, go to work and come home and then have the brain space and the time to focus on their studio practice and I know other people that kind of rely on grants and things and try and do that um, or think oh, like me I juggled everything and I wouldn't necessarily recommend that but not I suppose once you graduate that's a good time to try these things and mm -hmm. um, because it is I imagine it would be harder um, trying to get into certain industries at a later stage in your life when you have limited experience in it whereas if you kind of try a lot of things while you can at least you can kind of develop on those skills a little bit more um, I completely forgot the question I'm sorry, I don't know <laughs> that's that okay so I was going to ask another question um, yeah no just uh, bodies of work like how did you find it yes. going from um, your arts residency work then pushing through into your new work and then I know that you've gone and done a residency in India and then it was exhibited in New York but just how did you find the balance of doing it all also mentally how did you kind of push yourself on to continue doing that yes. body of work so I tried to get the most that I could out of my graduate show mm -hmm. which I think is important because you put so much time into it and then sometimes it's exhibited once and that's it and it's like do you store it do you try and sell it do you exhibit it again so um, I did exhibit my graduate work in a couple of different places and um, did a couple of uh, shows around that and then ended up getting it framed and then putting it in different spaces just because it was just going to win the storage otherwise. And Commercial rather, spaces or? Um, some, some galleries, some libraries, some cafes, things like that. So, mm -hmm. um, and then that was just me emailing people like, hi, I do smart work. <laughs> um, and I think some people have the idea that they should, that these spaces should purchase your work. Um, and it's great if they're able to do that, but if they're not able to do that, you still get your artwork displayed and people see it and there's more of a chance that people ask about you or something comes of that rather yeah. than you like refusing to give it to someone because they haven't purchased it um, and also for me it would just go back into storage so I would, I would rather that it was on display or someone could enjoy it um, than just taking up space in my house. <laughs> um, so I tried to get the most out of my graduate collection and then after that um, I wanted to keep exhibiting and um, I mean I did that was a learning curve as well so I did exhibitions and um, you know, people wanted to display artwork in places that they wouldn't usually find artwork, which is a nice idea, but then, you know, you can't put textiles, my printed textiles in like a swimming pool or something mm -hmm. like that, which some people wanted to do. Um, so you kind of uh, learn a little bit more about um, the spaces that you want to exhibit in and who runs those and how they're run and, and how people curate shows and kind of when up when calls and submissions are out and what you can you get a kind of timeline that you can work towards if you mm -hmm. want to create new work or submit work that you already have that might fit a theme um but then it becomes quite pressured if you apply to do an exhibition and you don't have any work for it so you have to make work for that exhibition specifically yeah. but then you also have to work for your jobs to make a living and um, so that's quite a lot of pressure on your own time and then it's hard to get a balance of work that you want to create when you don't have time to fully experiment and explore and develop that and um, because you have you have the show in a month or whatever and you just have to fill the walls yeah. um, which is kind of the harsh real reality of it sometimes and um, which is why I think it's important to if that's what you want to focus on to really carve out time to develop those skills and um, 
just have more intentional work in spaces if that's what you want to do. And what about, um, have you learnt, obviously you're doing various jobs and we'll not name the organisations that you're working for because we're talking from your personal experience, but do you feel you've gotten, um, because they are, are art-based jobs, what kind of skills do you think you've gotten from those organisations? Um, well, I've definitely got arts admin skills, um, which I think is important to kind of understand, uh, no matter what, if, like as an artist, um, because you understand the kind of logistics and practicalities of things, um, so that you don't just expect, you know, to get a certain space or a certain show just because of who you are or your own merits or whatever, like there is a kind of whole structure behind these organisations and how they work and even the capacity of their own resources and what they're, how they're able to support you, um, I think is kind of important to understand all of those aspects. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I've tried a bit of arts admin and I've done a festival circuit and I have taught different groups of people um, and even kind of the conversation of negotiating how you should be paid for that work is something that you have to learn as well. I mean, they covered it a little bit in university, but they didn't, again, you don't have a blanket approach. There's no yeah. like, if you're doing this job, this is how you do this because each organization is different. Um, and depending on where in the world it is, they work differently. Um, so even having those conversations and even allowing yourself to have the conversation about money, because someone really wants to talk about that. Um, but just knowing what you need a contract for, what you need to sign for, what you need to agree first of all, just knowing where you stand um, and not being kind of ashamed or embarrassed or reserved about that because it's such a normal thing. I think especially women maybe as well, yeah. they might be a little more hesitant to ask those things in certain sectors or environments. Um, so if you just kind of, the more you normalise it, then the more it just integrates into your everyday life. Like, you want this job, product, service, this is how it works, this is what I charge for that, and that's just a normal thing. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned previously about you removed the functionality from, uh, or rather the idea of a function um, from your degree pieces. You didn't necessarily want, you wanted them to be an art wall piece or a wall art piece. Sorry. Um, and you do work in the uh, craft sector, you do work in visual art sector. Uh, has it ever been um, uh, an idea that you would make a retail range? Um, is that something that you are thinking of ever exploring? Um, you've always made this kind of gallery style work. Um, uh, would you ever try to bring the function back in? Um, to your, your making at all or is that not something that you're, you're um, really focused on at all? Yeah, no, I think it's something I wouldn't rule out. Uh, I just haven't figured it out yet. So I did a, a range of Christmas decorations um, just because it was um, a kind of obvious target to work towards. Um, and even then I didn't start early enough um, to kind of make all the things in time for sort of November to get them into shops and spaces and even to you know you make them and then photograph them and um, market them and then deliver them and then there's follow-up work with that so um i think jen puts us all the shame in terms of organization absolutely like, <laughs> january you already start your christmas decoration preparation <laughs> i have nothing else to do <laughs> i'm so excited about christmas i have That's christmas all year round if i, if I did but yeah. um yeah and that in itself is a full-time job and i think that's something I took for granted as well. It's not really something you can do on the side because mm -hmm. there is, to do it well, it's a full-time job. Um, so I think that's what was sort of holding me back a bit because I don't have the time to commit to that as one job. Um, so I just, I mean, it, the doing Christmas decorations was a good little experiment to kind of understand the work that goes into it and the process and how much time that takes mm -hmm. um, and just develop methods of doing that um, and yeah I just haven't really figured out what it is that I want to make and what function I want it to have if it will still be a 
small art piece for the home that's more kind of affordable and accessible mm -hmm. um, to more people or if it's more kind of specialist or uh, yeah I'm not really sure and then there were lots of sort of elements of what materials do I use and how environmentally friendly they are and how much waste is involved in that or where are they manufactured and is that ethical and those sort of things would be I would value so um that was actually something I was going to ask you. Um, how do you find your ethics within your industry? Because obviously, again, we're, we'll go into the Indian business in a minute. But obviously, there is a considerable number of ethical questions around textiles and where textiles originate from and how they're used and dyeing processes and things like that. Like, what are your conscious choices that you make when either purchasing or making? Um, I know I'm actually quite ashamed that the, the, I don't know the exact statistic but I think textiles is like the second or third worst contributor to global warming and climate change and um, and people don't really realise that I don't think yeah. because it's not obvious in the way that um, gas emissions are or something um, but yeah the whole fast fashion um, consumer culture has really fed into that and um, especially within the fashion industry, um, but textiles in general, um, people just like to buy new all the time and don't necessarily take the time to repair things because everything is so cheap they'll just buy yeah. more mm -hmm. and throw it out and it's not like when you throw it out or even whenever you donate it to a charity shop it goes away. I mean it's still there and a lot of the fibres have um, man-made materials in them so they don't necessarily disintegrate. Um, which yeah it's something that I'm very conscious of um, which is why I do like using linen um, and the Biennale conference was actually great for that they kind of um, explored all different aspects of linen and how sustainable it can be and how it can be used for medical purposes and, and it has all sorts of magical healing powers that aren't really that magical but <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah I think it just um, even outside of art, just being more kind of deliberate about your uh, purchases mm -hmm. and uh, decisions on what it is that you buy and why you buy them and how it fills your your space as well because you can just be overwhelmed with stuff. Um, I'm, I mean, I tidied my studio recently and I was really excited about it. <laughs> um, just to have everything in a place and then yeah. to have everything there that had a purpose in a sense. And I know some artists can be hoarders and oh you never know what you might use this for but I try to be really um deliberate and conscious about what I bring into my studio space and why it's there and if I purchase it who makes it and if it's um ethically made and what I'll use it for and then even when if, if I sell it like what's going to happen to it when I sell it and just asking yourself all those questions I think it's important to at least think about and consider. Awesome, brilliant. Um, I was also going to ask you about uh, so your Indian residency. Um, how did that come about? How did you find it? And what sort of work has come out of it? Um, yeah, so I did a residency in India from January to the middle of February earlier this year. And I know you were in India as well, Robin. <laughs> and uh, you were very supportive of my application, so thank you very much for that. You're welcome. <laughs> um, and so it's supported by the Arts Council of Northern Ireland and the British Council in Northern Ireland. And uh, it's such a fantastic opportunity. They uh, cover your travel and accommodation expenses. And I stayed in a place called Sanskriti in New Delhi. And it's just a completely different world. I think it's really important to travel whenever you can, especially to experience a, a culture that's so different to your own. Um, and yeah, I think you just kind of learn how unique Northern Ireland is as well, the, for, the more you travel. Um, but yeah, their India was just a completely different experience. Like they, uh, the place I stayed, there were lots of car cuts and uh, the Wi-Fi was awful and uh, the food was amazing. But I didn't, um, I didn't bring a laptop or anything with me. Um, so it was so weird whenever I came back to stare at a screen that was bigger than my phone. Um, but it was really refreshing as well because I a lot of my jobs require me to sit in front of a, a computer screen all day, uh, which I find has a really kind of negative effect on your mental health. So 
it was so refreshing to spend six weeks just kind of not living in the moment but like just kind of being more present than you would because I think you can get so distracted by social media and on our phones and all the kind of all the stuff online so um I had this idea that I wanted to go and just completely strip it back so I had half a suitcase of linen and thread with me um, and then I explored the textile a little bit in India but interestingly they're all very functional so the idea of having a, a textile art piece that just hangs on a wall they just didn't really get unless it was in a museum mm -hmm. um, you know a lot of everything everywhere you go everything's hand stitched or hand printed or um, you know people put a lot of time and effort into textiles in India but it has a function mm -hmm. and then just the price that they sell things for as well isn't always what we would equate it to here and it just has a different kind of level of respect I think or understanding that people there understand how much work goes into it but here we would appreciate it as a kind of craft item in and of itself mm -hmm. but there you know they would embroider like white covers and tea covers and like everything anything they could possibly embroider they would <laughs> that would be functional um, I remember doing a uh, printing workshop uh, with a really lovely man that didn't speak any English and I basically just had to like copy what he was doing step by step but if I tried to deviate or experiment at all from what we were doing he got very stressed out oh. <laughs> and so you could do all that in your own time but then everything kind of you know if you're making a sari or a scarf, a scarf you print this design in this particular way and you might be able to change the colour slightly, but there's not a lot of kind of wiggle room for that. Um, but yeah, it was just a completely different culture and it was really refreshing to uh, and fully immerse yourself in it. Um, and then, but then I did get a bit kind of, uh, I don't know, I suppose I had imposter syndrome a little bit. And, you know, you see the level of poverty and just a different way of life and you kind of think, who am I to comment on these things or why am I making art and what is it for or what's it going to change in the world when there are all these terrible things that are happening in the world mm -hmm. and then you kind of have to realise this is what you do and you're an artist and you're here to question and provoke and do all these things so I think that's something I kind of go back and forth with and struggle with sometimes. Yeah so you just kind of went there with the intention of being a sponge you just wanted to yeah exactly not you know be the kind of in front of the screens and just absorb really um, yeah the culture. and then going back to just having some linen and a needle and thread um, and not using photoshop and not overly editing and designing things and i did that for a while and i was like okay this is good and i like rust dyed and i did some natural dyeing and that was great to go back to but I also find that it's the, my ability to respond to things that kind of is my starting point so we have almost like a white blank page except it was a blank piece of linen mm -hmm. and I was a bit like oh what do I do with this like there's no nothing to respond to there's no marks there's no stains on it and it was linen I already had or fine fabric um, but it just happened to be very clean and I couldn't really <laughs> um, I got a bit overwhelmed by that um, so I ended up kind of um, going around uh, different tailors and asking for offcuts of um, their saris and things and trying to get um, a feel for different materials that they had without purchasing it um, because there is a lot of uh, waste fabric in mm -hmm. India which kind of contributes to the wider picture and problem. Um, so I was really conscious of that and I didn't want to purchase new material or material as a rule. Um, and I wanted to use a lot of fine fabrics and um, just see what I could do with that. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I tried it and I'm glad I did, but at the same time I was like, oh, I actually miss the digital side of things and the printing mm -hmm. just because that adds another element to it. So I, I did it and I'll go back to it, but I'm glad that I tried it without it. Um, and it just sort of gave me a kind of, oh, this is how I work and it's fine to work that way. You don't constantly have to reinvent yourself if that's what works for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had the exhibition in New York uh, started in April, mm -hmm. so I had to make work for that, but I didn't necessarily put myself under the pressure of 
I have to make all of that work while I'm in India mm. and I was really there to absorb and kind of yeah be a sponge as you say and just see what came out of it and it was just so refreshing to when we have like you know to be able to treat that as a job in and of itself and not have to I mean I just like basically deleted all my social media accounts <laughs> and um like took all my emails off my phone and like didn't have to wasn't distracted by any of those things and didn't have all of my other jobs in my mind and all I had to think about was my work and my practice and how I could develop that so yeah it was really refreshing and I really recommend it to anyone that could apply yeah amazing what is your proudest achievement so far Ooh. I think I an exhibition in New York and I'm quite proud of that That's pretty but I also feel like I should explain that a little bit because okay. it sounds quite high blue like oh I was in India and then I had this thing in New York and <laughs> but you're that kind of wonder woman anyway yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's great but there are like there is a process behind all of that and I think it's important to kind of explain that and not just kind of come across as these things just happen naturally because they don't um so India was like you helped me with my application for that and that was great um but again, it's that, that thing like I applied for, I kind of panic applied for so many things after I graduated. Mm. So I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. So then I got so many rejection letters and that's completely fine because it definitely wasn't qualified for a lot of things I was applying for. Um, and then, um, yeah, so after I did the, I did an exhibition for the Leonard Biennale and uh, it was kind of someone who knew someone that wanted um, a textile artist that specifically worked on linen and in a way it was kind of a mixture of who I knew and then what I happened to be doing at the time that fitted um, and that it's quite a shame that sometimes it can be a little bit about who you know um, and what opportunities that can present for you but also the more you work that you do and put yourself out there in different contexts you never know what's going to come of something or mm -hmm. who someone might know or what would happen with that opportunity. So I think, um, especially in the kind of first couple of years of graduating, I was just kind of saying yes to everything that I built up contacts in different areas. So different people know me from different things. Um, and some people didn't know that I was a textile artist and kind of see me like at the Linen Biennale conference. And I was kind of like, yeah, like, that's me on the cover. Like that's my work. And they were like, oh. Um, so yeah, that's quite fun, but um, yeah, so it was basically someone who knew someone um, that needed uh, a textile artist and then the gallery rang me up and um, yeah, it, even that it, uh, the experience was um, kind of felt like, oh, I'm a real artist now, which sounds ridiculous because you're an artist, like whenever you graduate from your, your practice an artist and it's okay to call yourself an artist, but I kind of felt like, oh, I have this exhibition and they were kind of advertising me as an artist and it's like it's okay to call yourself that even if you have other job roles and other job yeah. titles mm. and so just um to kind of backtrack a little bit um Sorry. it obviously mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense you were part of the linen biennale um but i say in that way i remember robert and uh, so they have some kind of uh, something and yeah Sally, Ryan, you know, and I yeah I, I think i've got <laughs> I think that. that's right yeah. but anyway um so yeah it made a lot of sense that you were part of that but was your glitch your glitched exhibition um was that something that you had organized already um and then it was something that was integrated into it or was that just a kind of um something that they suggested you know um, so they just put a call out um, for exhibition submissions okay. and I applied and then they accepted and I was like this is great and then, there was, and then you kind of realise the amount of work that's involved in that and you're like oh I got accepted to do this exhibition that's part of this thing and that's great but then you realise that you have to make the work and then you have to market yourself and you have to find your own space and uh, do all these things that are a lot of work mm. um, and it was a great opportunity but there is a lot of work in that and I think that's something you have to take into account whenever you're applying for these things and then so if you do get it you kind of think is this uh, worth it in a sense like is this worth my time do I have the time to put into this and uh, like for me it was really worth it and I got an exhibition in New York kind of off the back of it yeah. but, um, but I, I could have never have known that whenever I was applying so I think it's just about having that open-minded attitude towards 
everything that you do and you never know where this is going to lead but also have you know it's a fine line between like I said doing things for experience and getting paid to do things and it's what what do you want to get experience in and is it worth putting your time into something um which is kind of hard to navigate through sometimes um so yeah I did I applied and then had to put the exhibition together myself and I had this idea in my head that I wanted to do so that's when I started to interview people from Randallstown and do a little bit more research into the factory and kind of integrate that into my work um, and I ended up um, so I, I had that an idea of what I wanted it to look like and then the space that I ended up exhibiting in was a little different so I basically took over um, one of the floors of one of my offices because they had stripped it back and they were renovating it and uh, it was all kind of bare brick walls and copper pipes and it looked very industrial mm-hmm. um, and I just thought it'd be good to uh, hang my work in there even though I couldn't exhibit exhibit it there so um, yeah I just kind of went in and I'm really lucky that I have lots of creative friends so I just kind of brought them all around and bought them coffee and donuts and then <laughs> put my work up in a day and then we filmed it and I got my friend to um, play violin on it and then uh, my partner Stephen made a song for it as well and just put a video together and kind of paid them what I could out of my own money but they were happy to do it anyway yeah. and then that was a good um, a good way to market what I was doing and then it was a good thing to show the gallery in New York and that's a good thing to kind of refer back to mm-hmm. whenever I'm applying for other things so Definitely. Yeah, it was really, about. really beautiful. It was it was absolutely gorgeous. gorgeous. <laughs> um, definitely. Um, what is next after your exhibition in New York? Um, what's happening? What's 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 the next thing? Are you know, are you going to the moon? What's you know, that kind of feels um, like how do you how do you kind of yeah, organize to continue after that? Yeah, I think um I have quite a lateral approach to things, so I don't necessarily see it as kind of going up and up or you know being a one hit wonder and doing uh, trying to live up to your own expectations or your own level of whatever it is that you've achieved I think you just kind of keep going and keep doing stuff um, and see what happens basically is my approach to it so um, I'm really grateful for Lennon and everything that's done for me um, but I think I'm quite excited to try other materials um, and I am also really interested to get my teeth into some research to do with um, social media and the effects of that on their mental health and kind of do a project around that. Um, I, I kind of want to go a little bigger and like away from wall art just for a while to kind of see what happens. So make kind of more immersive experiences and do installation work and um, try because I've been trying to figure out how to make my work bigger scale for a while in a way that's more affordable mm-hmm. um, and I think definitely coming back from India really taught me to how important it is to give time to my studio practice to allow me to develop that in the way that I want rather than it being always being a low priority because it doesn't make me any money and mm-hmm. um, that's definitely not the attitude to have yeah. so yeah that's kind of where I want my work to go next and then I will be moving to Canada very soon, so mm-hmm. hopefully I will have some kind of exhibition while I'm there, and then mm-hmm. if I can figure out how to develop a product range in a way that I want to do that as well, I think those are things that I want to focus on more than juggling lots of different jobs. I'd rather kind of have a main job mm-hmm. in whatever field that might be, and then have a more brain space to think about the creative things that I want to think about and develop. That is very exciting and yeah. very inspiring, actually. I just want to go out and make my yeah. yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> so lovely. Okay, so little question. So what's the last piece of music you have bought? Oh, I feel quite bad because I, I don't really buy music. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. But I did. I mean, my uh, fiancé um, is really into music and he uh, has a really beautiful record player. Um, so I got him some uh, Bob Dylan vinyls for Christmas and War of the Worlds actually which he really loves oh. um, and the last piece that I bought um, I think I bought Neil Young's um, 
album for Stephen, but it was really for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I love Spotify for music, and yeah. uh, I've been really into Miles Davis recently. Oh, so. very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Right, so um, I'm going to ask another one. Um, what is the last locally made piece of craft you have bought or had purchased for you to own for yourself? Oh, not, for not, me, yeah, not, not as a gift, yeah, but like, because obviously, yeah, everything that you buy for people as gifts is locally made craft, but <laughs> well, course, yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah. Oh, for myself, actually, um, oh. I can't remember what I bought because a, a lot of the things that are locally made, handcrafted things, I give away. Mm. Um, and I did that all for Christmas one year, and then I kind of realised not everyone appreciates locally made handcraft. And um, but I did. It wasn't for myself, but um, for one of the organisations I work for, um, they all flew over, and then we had our little Christmas do in Belfast, which we don't always get to do because we all work remotely. Mm -hmm. Um, and I uh made up little um Christmas bags for them and gave them all a little Christmas bubble that was handmade and um, oh. like a little candy cane and some chocolates and stuff in there. Oh, so nice. Wow. Um, but yeah, I, I can't remember I honestly can't remember what I bought but I kept for myself because I'm always like this is so beautiful and someone else should appreciate this. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so I always end up yeah. giving away. That's all right then, yeah. <laughs> and I don't have the space to put it in yet, so I think that's why I don't tend to keep things, craft things for myself because I'm always so scared of breaking it if I have to transport it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a big issue though, isn't it? It's, yeah. Um, so I was going to ask, what is a favourite gift that you've ever received? It doesn't have to be craft, it can be anything, but like in your entire life, what's the best present you've ever gotten? <gasps> doesn't have to be expensive, to be sentimental, just literally anything that you can. Oh, um, one of my friends gave me one of those uh, boxes that had all the envelopes in it and kind of said open this when you need motivation open this when you need oh, a drink and she had like a fiver in it and like oh. a wine voucher and <laughs> open this when you're running late and it was just like oh that's cute because you're always running late um, but it was so nice because she took the time to like actually print things out and set and cut them out and stuck them on and it just showed you how well she knew me which was really nice and that's so um, but I also got a giant um cookie that was decorated like the cookie monster which was just for a good reason which was a really nice surprise <laughs> wow yeah uh, i definitely put food well up there the <laughs> gifts that you could possibly get yeah you remember them so well yeah oh definitely so emotional too um, and then locally what's your what's the quirkiest weirdest space you've ever been to i must say exhibitions but is your favorite experience locally because you want to promote you know Northern Ireland, Ireland as a whole, so that's fantastic. Um, so I definitely have to plug Glasgowry. Um, I think I might have lectured you both on this before, but there is this <laughs> uh, beautiful space in Draperstown called Glasgowry, and they used to run a festival um, up in the mountains and on Eagles Rock, and now it's a community space, and they teach um, dance workshops and music workshops, and they kind of create bands and um, kind of build bands up from the ground up. Um, but they also do ceramics classes and they're open to anything um, but there, there's honestly no place like it they're just all so welcoming and um, it's just really special to see the the people that come out of a space like that um, and the achievements that they have and um, that everyone's just so supportive of each other and it's just a really nice environment to be in so um, I know it is a ways away from Belfast, but if you are in <laughs> Mid Ulster, to go to Great Britain. <laughs> Amazing, excellent. And then, do you have uh, yeah, your favourite sort of thing? What kind of whatever you're making? Do you have anything you listen to, podcasts or music or anything to kind of get you in the right vibe and mindset? Um, I got quite into podcasts recently, so I love The Guilty Feminist, um, yeah, but I do kind of, big drop, <laughs> I kind of drop in and out of it, um, just because sometimes sometimes you can kind of listen to it absentmindedly and sometimes you kind of are really absorbed in it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I have Stephen Carr talk all the time because I'm quite bad at um, consciously listening to music like I'll have the same playlist or album that I'll just listen to on repeat and he's like oh can you listen to this again <laughs> um 
but yeah, I kind of switch between podcasts and then um, Spotify playlists that I make. Um, or if I get to a certain, especially whenever I was making Christmas decorations, actually, I think I watched like a full series of Grey's Anatomy just because <laughs> I could just stitch away when yeah. I was doing that and I didn't yeah. have to think too much about what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, good background kind yeah. of activity to have on. Yeah, I know, but it's all very emotional, you know how, you oh. know how great it is. Um, Grey's Anatomy is. <laughs> oh, of course. Someone always dies. Someone yeah. always gets a good cry. cry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a bit very <laughs> emotional. Journey. Mm. Um, and then also I was wondering, do you have any tips or advice for people sort of leaving any or even getting into the creative field or yeah, or what's the best um advice you've ever been given? Ooh, that's a good question. Um I think um trying things out while you can is important and it's hard to know what you want to do um at like a, after you graduate um, or hard, hard to know who to talk to or hard to get into certain industries so I think just having the kind of willingness to learn um, from it so I kind of did a lot of internships whenever I graduated which was kind of my into different industries mm-hmm. um, and then I suppose trying to get into an industry um, that I appreciate how hard that can be if you haven't been to uni or you're not really in that world because I think here and probably in other parts of the world, but it's quite a small country and a lot of people, everyone knows each other or there's kind of that six degrees of separation. So, um, yeah, I can appreciate how hard it would be for someone that's not in that world to try and get into it without the kind of education or um, like a kind of structured organisation that you or system that you go through that introduces you to all these things. Mm. Um, so I don't really know what to advise people like that. Okay. Yeah. That'd great. be good to find out though and share. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we find it, we will share it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been absolutely amazing. Thank, uh, thank you, you so, much. so, so much. Um, just if people want to follow your journey of making, where would be the best place um, to go? So you can go to my website if you really want, but I do need to update it, so maybe don't do <laughs> don't that. Don't we all? <laughs> um, so I am just Maria McCormick on all my social handles, so I think it kind of varies between art and artist. Um, Maria McCormick artist on Instagram and Maria M. McCormick art on Twitter. Okay. And I'm on Facebook as well, so. Um, and we'll link something on the website. Yes, so absolutely. Thank you guys. You can go to makingconversationspodcast.com and all the information will be on there. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. So, yeah. Thank you, Dears. Thank so, you so, so much for having me. Yeah. Yeah. All of the future. Thank stuff. you for supporting craft and artists and for being amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> okay. We hope you all enjoyed listening to Maria's journey and thank you once again, Maria, for joining us. Our next episode we'll be talking to glassblower Helena Hancock, so don't miss it. <laughs>